Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Talk to the CEO live on Facebook Live. I'm Darielle Snipes with the CMSD News Bureau. Tonight, Superintendent and CEO Eric Gordon will be answering your questions live. And this is how it's going to work. Ask your questions in the comments below and a member of the communications team will review it and then send it to me so that I can ask Mr. Gordon. Well, without further ado, let's get started with our questions and welcome CEO and Superintendent Eric Gordon. Welcome. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. So while we wait for questions, let's get started. Um, I have a few of my own. Um, and so this week you announced that you will be stepping down as CEO um, come the end of the school year. Um, just want to ask why now? What, what was your decision? Why do you think this is a good time to step down? You know, um, the district is positioned in a really good space. We have the best financial health we've had in decades. Um, we have all, all of our labor contracts signed, labor peace, labor collaboration. We have a really strong strategic plan and a vision. We're getting our new report card, which sets a baseline for the future. Here's where we start, there's where we're going. We have the refreshed Cleveland plan. My own senior leadership team has turned over nearly half of the team. And you know, as a leader, um, leaving the organization for the next leader at its healthiest point is the best way to ensure continued success and continued progress. And so as much as I love this work and it's been my life's work and my passion, you know, for the last 11 years in this role, and today's actually my 16th anniversary Happy in the anniversary. district. Happy anniversary. Thank you. <laughs> um, for all of that, I made the difficult, but I know important decision to set the district up for its future success by stepping down at the end of the year. We've missed this window too many times in Cleveland and uh, turned over the district to new leaders when it was in a weakened state or even crisis state. Uh, what I want to do is turn it over when it's at one of its healthiest states so that it continues to be successful and lives beyond me. I understand. So you say you're going to be working until your last day in June. You know, a lot of people kind of check out, but you say you're going <laughs> to keep working. So what would you like to see done before you leave? You know, I think there's three things that I need to accomplish in this last year. The first is we really have to accelerate progress on emerging from the pandemic. We're getting our state report card tomorrow, so we're going to have a lot of evidence of where we are, you know, as a baseline. Uh, but we have to close the gap of the lost learning time for our youngest kids in particular and for our high school kids that need those credits. So really focused on that. The second is making sure our new PACE program or planning and career exploration program that we launched last year really gets solidly anchored into the district. We're focusing on sixth grade and ninth grade this year. Already have eighth grade with True to You. We'll do some work for 7, 10, 11, 12, but getting it anchored so that it will continue to build out past uh, my time here. And then the third is to ensure a smooth transition. Uh, we're, you know, I announced this decision now in September so that the board and the mayor have plenty of time to find the right next leader to continue our journey. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time to overlap and make sure that I can hand off the district in the final months uh, before the, the person fully takes the reins. So like you say, today's your anniversary, work anniversary, but you've been superintendent for almost 11 years. And so what are you most proud of as being superintendent and CEO of, of CMSD? Yeah, well, first of all, 11 years is about four times the national average. So I know a lot of people are saying, what, you're going? But, you know, uh, I'm not supposed to be here, actually. Um, you know, what am I most proud of? It's the kids, it, you know, uh, in little and big ways, you know. And, you know, I really am a fan of kids demonstrating their learning. And, and that can be big productions, you know, that our students do in the arts or their uh, performances on the athletic field or their science projects, but it can also be just the visits in the classroom where they're doing their little demonstrations of learning and, um, you know, just, you know, just the many, many ways that our amazing kids show up and, and you know, lean into their learning. You know, if there are bigger things I'm proud of, you know, I personally set three private goals when I got this job more than 11 years ago. One was to prove that we could improve the worst performing district in Ohio, and we've done that. Our 52% graduation rate then is 81% now. Black and Hispanic students graduating far higher than the state average. So we can and did improve the worst performing district in Ohio. The second was make it matter when, it, when, that, when we do. That diploma doesn't matter if it doesn't write your ticket to the next stage, but with Say Yes to Education and now over $95 million in the bank, every kid uh, for the next 25 years will be going to trade school, two-year or four-year college, and so that diploma matters. And then the third is 
now break down the barriers that made it so hard in the first place. And so when you add in the wraparound services, when you add in the legal services, the integrated health work we're expanding, uh, the family support specialists, the mentors for eighth graders, the mentors for college students, we're, make, we're removing those barriers that caused this in the first place. And so I feel like privately I've managed to achieve three really important uh, goals that I set for myself when I started this job. Yeah, and I know that a lot of people are singing your praises right now and thanking you for all the great work that you've done. I've seen a lot of comments on social media about that, so I know that um, you can be proud of the work that you did while you were here. Look, I'm sure there are some people that are dancing in the street that he's finally going, right? <laughs> but, you know, people have been really gracious, and that's always been something that I just love about Cleveland and Clevelanders is, you know, just the, the, just the, the graciousness of this community uh, through really tough journeys over the last 11 years, including the pandemic and everything we all went through mm -hmm. together. It just speaks to who we are as a community. I understand. So, so what's next? <laughs> so I have no idea. <laughs> I, I was saying to you before I started, I haven't been without a job since I was 14 years old and I've got to figure <laughs> out what I'm going to do next. What I do know is we're not leaving Cleveland. My wife and I are, are Clevelanders. Um, this is our home. So whatever I do do next will be here. Um, I don't have a secret job in the wings. I really did what I think is right for the community, and I will figure out what's right for me next. Um, I uh, hope to stay in education. I'm a 31-year veteran educator. It is my life's work, my life's passion. Um, so I guess we'll figure that out in the next 10 months, just like we're figuring out who the next leader here will be. I understand. Well, to be continued. <laughs> That's right. So you mentioned a little while ago about the state report card. It's coming out tomorrow. Um, given the last couple of years of students living in a pandemic and trying to learn in a pandemic, what do you expect to see tomorrow? Yeah, so unfortunately the state changed the report card, so we're not going to be able to compare apples to apples. We're not going to be able to say what was true in 2019 and what's true today because we no longer have the A to F system. We now have stars, one to five stars. So just want to name that that's going to be a little bit tricky. What we're going to see, I think, you know, we did some polling last spring and we asked people what they thought. And what they told us, 60% of the community said, look, the pandemic hit kids hard. And I think we're going to see that in the report card. But then we asked them, can kids recover? Can the school district recover? And 60% said, yeah, the school district can recover. And I think you're going to see that too. So I think you're going to see two signals. I think you're going to see uh, that the pandemic hit us hard, primarily for our earliest learners, uh, you know, literacy improvement in third grade reading. You know, and people don't realize how much we depend on watching people speak, watching sounds be made and words be formed. Uh, to learn to read and to learn to communicate until you have a mask over your mm -hmm. face and can't watch anymore And that happened for two years for our littlest kids, right? So I think we're gonna see some real impact there I think we're gonna see it in our graduation rate too after 11 years of record-breaking graduation rates I think we're gonna have our first regression um, Because kids couldn't get into the science labs couldn't get into the career tech labs It was hard to get those credit accumulations. So part of the message is gonna be yep the pandemic hit us hard but then you're also going to see that test scores have rebounded. You're going to see that our, our teachers and our kids made progress on what's called value added, that, that what they learned. You're going to see that we closed gaps. Um, those are the th signs that show we can make this up um, and that what teachers do matters and that our kids are catching up. And so I think you're going to see a little bit of both. And so where the areas where we did drop or we did see a decrease, um, what is the district doing to make sure to make up for that, say, for the next report card? Well, y you've heard me say this before. We're not going to fix two years worth of devastation in one semester or one school year. We have to play a long game, right? But we have to remember that we didn't lose learning. Right. We lost a lot of time, and that time has to be made up. But kids can still learn to read. Kids can still learn the courses they need to graduate. And so we have to be putting into place things that create those times. Summer learning experience is an example of that. The extra out-of-school time we're investing in. I'm getting ready to announce a new whole support system with 24-7 tutoring that's available across the district uh, that we're rolling out yet this quarter. Um, so finding in anywhere, anytime ways for kids to be catching up in addition to their in-school seat time that they are already have with their teachers. Wonderful. So I just want to remind everybody that we are doing a Facebook Live with CMSD CEO Eric Gordon and he is answering your questions. So if you have a question, please ask it in the comments below so that a member of the communications team can forward it to me so I can ask Mr. Gordon. So we do have one question so far. So where does enrollment stand? Are we gaining ground? Um, how does the pre-K and kindergarten numbers look? I know some of those numbers were lagging. 
Yeah, so we actually, enrollment has really grown from uh, before school started, we were under 35,000 kids. We're now almost to 38,000. So the numbers have been growing really, really quickly. We're really excited to have people back. Kindergarten and preschool always lag a little bit because kindergarten starts a little later and so does preschool. Kindergarten numbers are strong, kindergartners are back. Preschool numbers are about 300 smaller than they were in 2019 when we were at about 1,500. Uh, 1,500 students by this point, we're at about 1,200 right now. So not as strong as I'd like, and we know that a lot of families decided to kind of seek maybe family care or other ways, and, and don't often think of uh, the educational expo experience of preschool, but think more about the care experience. And yeah. so we have to continue to work to bring uh, kids back into preschool, because that's part of how we c catch up on this reading, is really focusing on three-year-old and four-year-old readiness too. High school numbers are a little soft too. We know we lost a lot of high school uh, kids into the workforce. Um, you know, we're competing with $20 an hour jobs at fast food. That sounds really exciting when you're a high school student until you realize that it's a great first job to quote McDonald's. I love that. But it's not the family sustaining wage that we want our kids to have. We have to get them off that sticky floor and into those high skill, high yield jobs. And that comes com from completing high school and going on to college. I understand. So another question, it came a little bit earlier before. Um, before we did this uh, Facebook Live, but define mastery concept for schools. How does that benefit kids? Yeah, so mastery is demonstrating that you know your content. So I'll give a really, uh, you know, kind of practical, easy example. We have a large number of our community who are immigrants, uh, who come to our country with a home language, and then typically we would sit them down and make them take a language course to get their language credit. But in mastery, you could you could say, okay, let me give you the academic assessment. And if you can pass that academic assessment because you already know the language, you get the credit, mm -hmm. right? So that's obviously a pretty easy one, I know the language, but the, the same concept applies that if you can demonstrate a mastery of a concept, you shouldn't have to sit in a seat time collecting seats. And the, the, you know, the, the contrary is true also, that getting, a, I was an algebra teacher, getting a D minus in algebra does not mean you actually know algebra, even though it passes you, mm -hmm. right? So mastery is really challenging our young people to demonstrate that they understand the content well. I'll give you an example that I actually observed. It was middle school students from Memorial School who were um, given the task of demonstrating their understanding of the life cycle of an ecosystem and the um, types of elements that ecosystems need to thrive. So the students got up and they talked about the life cycle. Um, they talked about abiotic and biotic elements, um, really knew the content, group after group after group. I saw one of the young men from that at Tech Fest at the beginning of the school year. So now this is months later. And, I, and he said, you came to my class for my presentation. And I said, oh, you did the ecosystem. I said, do you remember it? He told me the ecosystem. He told me examples of biotic and abiotic. That's mastery. He knows that content. So we're really working hard to shift to kids working on complex tests that they master their skills, knowing that if they can master those skills, the tests will take care of themselves because when that kid sees ecos ecosystem questions, he's got them. And it's also true that if, say, a student, it takes them a little bit longer, it's okay. So that if, you know, they're in 10th grade and they're supposed to do algebra, but they still need more time in 11th grade to complete that algebra, it's okay. And it's not like they failed algebra, they just need more time. Well, and the reality is in a seat type driven environment, which is what most of K-12 education is in this country, an industrial model, one of two things happen. You have a lot of kids who are sitting bored because they already got the content and they're ready to move on. You have a lot of kids that only barely get by and then we move to credit recovery and all these other things to get them to the end of the day. And, and so they're already moving at their own pace. Uh, we just use seat time to kind of contain that movement. Uh -huh. But what, what a mastery system allows us to do is to move at that pace when they have learned the content and not have the social promotion kind of effects of, well, you got the D minus, so now you're in geometry, even though you really don't know your concepts from algebra, or you were ready you know, three weeks ago to move on, but you're sitting tight waiting for everybody else. So it gives us some more flexibility to move kids at their own pace, which is really happening anyway. Mm -hmm. We just have to acknowledge it and then embrace it as a tool for improving learning. I understand. Well, here's a question from Lisa. We can recover if we finally start taking the social and emotional well-being of all of our students seriously by putting school counselors back in the K-8 buildings. I do not feel that there is any proactive work being done with those elementary and middle school age groups. Please explain what is being done to help students with their social and emotional learning. 
Yeah, so it would be great to have K-8 counselors in every, every one of our buildings. The, the fact is that there are not enough people out there, uh, one, and secondly, budgetarily, we just wouldn't be able to sustain it. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be aggressively focusing on that. And so first, uh, we really focused on relationships, rituals, and routines. We have a whole toolkit that all of the school, the teachers and the, and the school personnel work on uh, to make sure that we have those resources for social emotional learning. We also teach a full social emotional learning curriculum, paths at the early grades, second step at the middle grades, so that kids are really learning self-regulation, self-management, relationship experiences, problem solving, those sorts of things. So there's that general tier one. We also then have kind of a tier two wraparound support where there is a student support team in place at schools that can really say, if Daryl's having trouble, how are we going to use what's called the pre-referral intervention manual to know strategies that we can help for that uh, young person. And then we have a tier three where we have partnerships with the mental health agencies in town. Every one of our schools has a connection to you know, one of the mental health agencies where we can actually refer kids who need extra support. We also refer through our Family Support Specialist Center um, uh, uh, Say Yes program, which is now in every school building, and that has access directly to the United Way 211 database so that we can get to the mental and behavioral health needs of, of young people as well as other needs that they might have. But I don't disagree with, I think it was Lisa, mm -hmm. that it would be ideal to have counselors at, you know, in every building at every grade level. Um, you know, and, and maybe someday in this country we'll finally fund education in a way that really makes that happen. I understand. And, you know, going, it goes back to, um, you know, employment. I know that you know, CMSD is doing a great job with hiring teachers and, and support staff, and we are at, is it almost like 95% staff? Yeah, we're at 95% staffed with certificated people. We're at 98.5% staffed when we add in some su substitute teachers. We are still hiring. There's a hiring fair actually on the 22nd, next Thursday, uh, for substitutes and for operations side employees. So anybody who has a high school diploma uh, who is interested in jobs with good pay and great benefits should come out over to East Professional Center. We do our hiring on the spot. Um, but so um, we've got that in place. We're also doing some adjusting right now based net on enrollment settling in so that we can fill some of those um, vacant positions or if we don't need them, close them out. Um, so we're doing better than most in, a, in what is a, frankly, a national crisis. The uh, Cleveland State University, as one example, had 50 fewer teacher candidates than this year than they would typically have. Yeah. So that's a third. They usually have 150 candidates a year. This year they had only about 100. Um, that's not even going to touch us for two more years when we're all still looking for teachers and the teacher core is even that much smaller. So there's a real challenge in this industry. It's even exacerbated, going back to the counselor question, there are just almost no people seeking uh, school counseling credentials anymore, which means even if we could fund one per building, we wouldn't be able to find the people to, fund, uh, to, to fill them. Wow, that's, that's not good. Um, Doug is asking, can you talk about the extended time for art and music in the district? Are all CMSD schools offering those classes for children? So all pre-K through eight schools have either a zero period or a ninth period now where they can offer art, music, and physical education. They are offering those subjects, but the content is varied at each school depending on interests of the kids, uh, abilities of the teachers, partners that we're able to bring in. And so, for example, I know at AB Heart, they've been doing a lot with pottery and using their kiln as just one example. Um, we have programs with the Cavs and doing basketball clinics um, for wellness as, as another example. Um, but every school, um, every pre-K-8 school has either a zero or a ninth period, unless they were already an extended day, that's already built into their day. Um, that's about four schools, five schools, but the typical K-8 school, it does have the opportunity and is offering that extra period of art, music, and physical education. And then there's also, if a student wants to do All City Arts, they can also... There's, there's also our city, All City Arts. We also have um, out-of-school programming in every pre-K-8 building that we're funding through our ESSER funding, uh, which are more clubs and activities and tutoring and those sorts of things. We've expanded the Senate League. Uh, we've ex uh, also expanded our eSports programming. Uh, we're now working on streaming clubs where the kids can actually run the streaming of all of our events and learn how to do what your industry is, right, mm -hmm. um, broadcast journalism. Uh, we're working on a journalism uh, program tied to the News Bureau where kids can be stringers for the News Bureau and tell their stories. Uh, we've got our Civics 2.0 program. So really trying hard to find ways to, to bring learning to life both in school and out of school over the course of this year. I understand. Um, so, you know, security is on the minds of some, as, as always, um, given what happened in Uvalde last school year. But then also we've had a couple of 
um, incidents here at CMSD, one that just happened recently where um, a student um, was shot on their way to school. Um, and so what is CMSD doing to protect students, say, to and from school as well as in the school buildings? Yeah, so first of all, I have to say we as a community, as Cleveland, have had events. Mm -hmm. um, this is not CMSD specific and like somehow kids are not part of our city, right? So I just want to be really clear, we have a city problem. We're not the only city that has that problem. This is a national crisis as well. Um, but youth have turned to violence. And so we have lost three kids to gun violence already this year. One at, in front of Glenville High School before school even started. Another over the weekend, a couple weekends ago, who went to East Technical High School. And then a young man who was walking to school uh, at Rhodes at uh, the beginning of last week that was shot and ultimately died. And we lost others. There are kids going to jail. There are kids who lost their life to jail. So I don't want us to forget that, that not only do we have victims here, we have victims and kids who felt like that was the only tool they had left. We have put a lot of resources into security. We have um, this year, every school has gone, gone through their code red training uh, so that if something were to happen inside of a building, everybody's practiced what to do. We've been upgrading our cameras in all of our buildings so that we have best line of sight possible to see what's going on in our buildings and on our grounds. We have been uh, continuing to hire our safety and security workforce. Uh, we are at, I would say, a minimum staffing of having an officer for every building. We have a couple where we're using our, our uh, mobile patrol to cover because of you know leaves of absence or things of that nature uh, but we're still hiring there too we actually ran our own training class we're the only school district in the state that ran our own training class over the summer actually taught by our commander Coates who teaches our Glenville students mm -hmm. private security because they're not yet old enough to be in um, public security mm -hmm. uh, so but done a lot there we just got a 1.6 million dollar grant to upgrade PA systems and door locks and things of that nature so we're doing a lot um, but if we don't as a community, and the district's part of the community, if we don't as a community really take on community violence that is spilling into schools, schools alone are not going to solve this problem. Um, and so I just want to really name that we as a community, you know, I, we have a lot to be proud of in Cleveland, but we have to name the things that we're not yet proud of and do something about it collectively and figuring out you know how do we help kids have pro-social experiences you know for middle school it's a lot of programming how do we get assemblies and things that remind kids because middle school kids thrive in group settings that and you know aren't yet figuring themselves out in like kind of the individual space mm -hmm. and anonymity is not good for kids because that's when they get they feel strong so we have to build relationships we have to you know work on that at high school it's more peer and you know personal knowing kids and adult and, and teen relationships so even that's part of the work we're trying to do and it's also would you say um, you know starting early I know that CMSD has a lot of programs like you just said like you know true to you you know mentorship programs that also deal with you know, career, but it also, th those mentors are also helping there and giving them advice um, just to help them steer them in the right direction. Absolutely. Mentorship is incredible, uh, incredibly important. We know uh, that young people that have two adults that they trust as safe, it doesn't have to be two parents, two adults that they trust that they can turn to are so much more likely to stay on track with pro-social be behaviors and thrive. Not one, two. And so we have to make sure that we leverage things like mentorships uh, and those kinds of opportunities to build those relationships where kids know where to turn and, and are willing to say, to, you know, when they get into an antisocial behavior, you know, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do this other thing. Um, but anonymity, you know, so many of our kids feel like they are unseen. And so they feel like if you're unseen, you're invincible. And so we've got to really tackle that again as a community because we can do everything we can do from eight to three o'clock. And then if a student is out on, you know, in the streets or out without anybody uh, engaged with them from three o'clock to eight o'clock or three o'clock to 11 o'clock, uh, that time is eroding anything that we could be doing in school if we're not collectively tackling this. I understand. So I just want to remind everyone that Mr. Gordon, Eric Gordon, is answering your questions. So if you have a question, please put it in the comments below. And so that way I can ask Mr. Gordon, because um, we only have a few more minutes with him. But I just wanted to ask another question. So always about student meals. Is there a supply chain issue that is, is making it difficult for the nutrition department to provide certain meals? So there's a few things going on with meals. And, and so first of all, it is a national pastime to hate school lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, but it got far worse with the pandemic. 
with with the pandemic, we were required to move to prepackaged meals and not scratch cooking. Um, and so a lot of the scratch or what's called semi-scratch where you take, you know, kind of a blue apron approach, we had to move back. We also, because we serve 38,000 lunches and nearly 20,000 breakfasts, we have to buy at a bulk size that is incredibly difficult to do with the, some of the supply chain issues that we have. And so that uh, leads to some food quality, you know, that it doesn't taste good, it doesn't present well. And under the USDA, we have some really, really strict guidelines about what we can and cannot serve. Sodium guidelines, um, you know, the types of grains we can serve, those sorts of things. And so uh, all of those things packaged together has made it a really difficult uh, last couple of years to provide the kind of the quality of meals that we would really like to be providing. I think those things are beginning to ease up, but it's kind of a balance because mm -hmm. I advocated to continue to have the meal flexibility, the EBT kinds of opportunities that were beneficial through the pandemic. Well, the USDA, which gave us those things, said, okay, but if you want those things, then you still have to follow pandemic rules. And mm -hmm. so we've got to find a way to, to you know, kind of decouple those and make sure we continue to get resources to kids and families who need them and get back to some more flexibility about meal service. I understand. We have a caregiver who has a question about say yes to education and the free tuition. Um, how long does the free tuition offer stand for graduates of students K through 12? A lot of students that I know were ill prepared for college when they graduated, but after um, they got their confidence, worked a few low paying jobs, um, even went to the military, um, just just maybe we're not ready you know to take up that offer will they be able to do so and for how long yeah so what i would say that this person recognizes in particular is the confidence for college so what we know is our graduation rates are up and our remediation rates are down so kids are more prepared than they realize mm -hmm. it's a confidence issue and so we have to help our kids understand that they can and will be successful in college so the the SAIA scholarship is available for one full year after high school so um, if you do, if you do kind of take a gap year, you can still pick it up. But that is when the clock stops. If you haven't taken it, then it's going to be turned around for another student. But we have put, particularly in Tri-Scene in Cuyahoga, um, uh, Cleveland State University, because of this confidence issue, we've actually put additional resources in, like intrusive counselors who are on campus only for say yes students to help you succeed, right? So we have to help our kids understand. And I, I actually talked to my student advisory about this one time, and I said, why, why do you think you can't do this? Well, because our teachers say you won't get away with that in college. <laughs> well, I remember my teacher mm -hmm. saying that too, but it was intended to motivate us. Right. So I've actually said to faculty, stop saying that. They're right. hearing it as you won't make it, you right. know. Um, but again, I want to stress graduation rates are up and remediation rates are down. So kids are more prepared than ever to be successful, but they have to have the confidence. And they have one year. After that one year, we cannot get them that say a scholarship anymore. And so I just want to remind folks, I mean, you know, CMSD has done a wonderful job with improving technology. Um, right now we have Wi-Fi on, uh, on the buses, so that's really cool. We have Wi-Fi on two-thirds of the buses, okay. and the reason it's not on the last third is because new buses are on the way. We're retiring those 20-year-old buses that are just past their useful life, and we're going to put the Wi-Fi on the new buses, not the old buses. We also have prox readers on the buses now so that when our students get on, they can swipe their ID so we know where they are. Uh, that we know they're on the bus, uh, so that's really important for us. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to upgrade technology everywhere our kids are. So it's anytime, anywhere learning. I, you know, if a student wants to be on their phone or the tablet or the device that they now get from school, uh, they can do that on the bus on the way to and way home from school. I understand. And so just um, before we go, I wanted to talk about the Segment 8 uh, projects. I know that this fall there's another round of community meetings. Where do we stand with the, with the Segment 8 uh, projects? Yeah, so Joseph Gallagher students have already moved to their temporary site, which is the old Garrett Morgan High School on Woodbine Avenue, uh, right up the street from Gallagher. Uh, and so we will be having a community meeting for the Joseph Gallagher community on Wednesday, September 21st. That's next Wednesday at 6 p.m. That will be at the Woodbine site, the, the temporary temporary Joseph Gallagher site. Uh, renovation is already underway. The fencing is up. We're, uh, we're getting started on that work. And so that'll be a two-year renovation before they get to move back into the completely refurbished uh, Joseph Gallagher building. Uh, the new Clark School, we're uh, well underway on the swing site for Clark. Clark will be moving up to the old H. Barbara Booker building, uh, which is going through its uh, refresh and renovation. That move will happen in January so that we can take down the old Clark and start building on that site. We have a meeting Wednesday, September 28th, so not 
this Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday uh, at 6 p.m. at Clark so that people can see the renderings based on the feedback from the last set of meetings. And I'm really pleased at the changes in the architectural designs that we got from the feedback from the community. Plus, we were able to buy some properties around it to expand the footprint at Clark because it's really wedged in right yeah. there. And then finally, Marion Seltzer, which uh, we are doing in partnership with the city and uh, the uh, uh, Cadell Recreation Center. Uh, so building a new school next to the old school and then swapping the old school land back into the park. And so we have a meeting there on October 19th from 6 o'clock to 7.30 at Cudell Rec Center so that people can see the renderings of that property and the whole park refurbishment too. Yes. And really, really important in that particular one to save uh, the memorial for Tamir Rice. Um, Tamir was one of our young men that was unfortunately killed on that property while playing with his um, airsoft. And uh, so just want to remember uh, Tamir and make sure that we protect that and build a building and a park that is worthy of Tamir and Tamir's spirit. I understand. Well, we are done. I'm done with all the questions. We're out, out of time. But, you know, I always like to leave you with the last word. So, you know, what, what's something that you would like to say to the families and the students? Or what do you think your lasting legacy will be here for, at CMSE? If you've thought about it. I know you just made the announcement this week and you have 10 more months to go. But, you know, just, just parting words. Uh, I guess a few things I would say. I don't know about lasting legacy. <laughs> but I would say uh, next Wednesday, is uh, my State of the School speech. It is live streamed for free on IdeaStream with our partnership with IdeaStream Public Media and the City Club of Cleveland. So, so parents and community members can watch it for free. Uh, and I'll be sharing more about how I came to this decision and why I think it's important. So people who are interested in knowing more, that's an, a forum to, to hear that in. Um, also just really want to thank our kids and our families and our educators for what a strong start to this school year. The way you start a year sets the tone for the year and we're off to a great start. And you know, as for legacy, you know, if in the end of the day I get to look back and see kids and families thriving, and knowing that I might have had a little small part of that, that's enough. So I'm just grateful to this community for what will be 12 years um, and, and for, you know, for them living their fullest life and hoping I had a tiny part of it. Oh, I think you did. And I know a lot of people are grateful for that. Well, thank you for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. And thank you for watching this Facebook Live edition of Talk to the CEO. Um, have a good night.